Okay, welcome to November's virtual JBoss News Group. Uh, this month we've got Andrew Rubinger talking about, um, so well, talking through some code examples from his O'Reilly book, Continuous Enterprise Development in Java. Uh, but before I hand over to Andrew, I'll just give you a quick overview of what we've got coming up over the next um, couple of months. So uh, next week, in fact, for the December virtual JBoss, we have Antoine Sabot Duran talking about CDI. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, CDI is the Java E specification for uh, context and dependency injection. Um, and uh, Antoine will be covering it from the basics right up to the advanced features. Uh, so Antoine is the co-lead of the CDI specification. So we've actually got a really good speaker um, coming next month. Um, Antoine will also be coming back in January um, where he's going to be talking about Apache Delta Spike. Uh, so uh, Delta Spike is essentially a set of extensions for using with CDI. Uh, okay, so uh, actually this this session that we're doing today is actually rescheduled from last week when Andrew, our speaker, was uh, rather sick. So hopefully he's feeling better this week. So I'll hand over to Andrew. Thank thank you very much for coming, and I hope you're feeling better. Hi, Hi guys. Am I am I now live? You are, yes, you're live. You can see me. I don't have to do anything. No, no, you can just you can just speak. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. All right. So, uh, thanks everyone for for coming in. And um, uh, this is my first time now on on the virtual JBug, so I'm I'm pretty excited to be to be doing this. Um, this is my apartment. Welcome. Um, and you can all I don't know if you've all met Lucy, but this is this is my Lucy, and uh, she hangs with me while I while I work and. Um, uh, an apology for last week. I, I was I was actually pretty sick, and while we were doing the pre-roll, uh, you know, with Paul, um, it, it just it wasn't going to happen. So uh, I, I hate to inconvenience anyone, and, and thanks for for bearing with us. And uh, I'm pretty excited to do this this presentation today. So um, let me. I think the majority of what we'll do today will be uh, a screen share, which I think will probably be a little bit more attractive than uh, staring at my mug. Um, is that coming through okay there, Paul? You can see that? I'll assume that you can. This is coming through. I had myself muted because I was talking. Yeah, no, cool. All right. Um, so uh, for this is a little bit of a more advanced talk. Um, we've been talking about Archelian in, in conferences for several years now, and the, the real goal is just to be doing testable enterprise development, right? And what we mean by that is that instead of just writing uh, like unit tests for your code, also making sure that it's working in its intended environment, and being open to that like Java EE does not operate in its own bubble. We integrate with plenty of other technologies, and we have like real life use cases that need to be done. So several years back, um, the project lead of Arkelian, Ashok Knutson, and I set out to write this book uh, that O'Reilly has published, and it's called Continuous Enterprise Development in Java. And what we wanted to do was take a really use case-based approach to doing development and making sure that all of our examples covered some part of an application that was probably going to be a common use case and show one way of solving it and also how we built it using EE Tech and some third-party stuff, and have it all be tested with Archelian. Uh, so the focus of this talk today is to run through a, like a few examples uh, as time permits. I usually have time to go through about three, and uh, show what the use case is, how we solved it, um, and how we tested it. Of course, there are many ways to solve any particular problem, but um, you know, we show one way, and and that's kind of our recommended approach. What we did with this book was, um, well, over here, we, we put the whole thing on GitHub, uh, as you can see, and it's under uh, Archelian Continuous Enterprise Development. And the whole book is open source. The folks at O'Reilly were really kind uh, in letting us use a, a Creative Commons license for this. Uh, when we say the whole book, we don't just mean the examples. We mean um, the book itself. So, for instance, it's, it's written in ASCII doc, and the, the entire contents of the book are all right here, as you can see. So you can go through and read it um, and follow along. 
the code examples as well are all kind of executable, and they're meant to be proof that what we're doing is is actually workable on your own machine. So uh, if you fork this repo, you can start to run it and go through the instructions. Um, chapter 4, well, I'll give kind of the basic layout. Um, the first few chapters are uh, kind of expository. They talk about uh, continuity. We talk about software development processes and why testing is so important and, and how we think we should be testing. We talk um, a little bit about our enabling technologies, which are obviously Archelian, obviously Java EE, but a lot of the other types of things that we end up using in practice, um, like Maven, like uh, the IDE, like Forge to bootstrap development, uh, and then various ways of making your deployments and, and shrink wrap. Um, the third chapter, um, details using a JBoss Forge to go, as we say, from scratch to production. And we've done several talks on this uh, over the years, and Pete Muir has also done several on his own, um, which involve taking a, a blank repository, making a Java EE application, and, and pushing it up. And it's, you know, it's kind of a toy app, but it shows that you can go from nothing to something in the cloud if you follow the instructions in just a few moments. So that one's always kind of fun to do on stage. Um, the fourth book talks about, uh, I'm sorry, the fourth chapter talks about the example application, and that's what we'll be going through today. Everything after this chapter um, deals with the example application, and we made one. If anyone's ever used, uh, for instance, the website Lanyard, Lanyard is pretty cool. Um, it's a conference tracker, so you can, like, authenticate with Twitter. Um, well, I'm not going to do this over live air, but you authenticate with Twitter and it'll show you um, conferences that you've spoken at, conferences you want to attend, who else is going to be there. It's a nice way of unifying things to, to show the various talks. And we build kind of like a simplified clone. Um, and, and that's going to give us several use cases to deal with in the book. Um, and I'll start off with just a few of these today. Um, I've gone through the liberty of importing the book examples here into JVoss Developer Studio, as you can see. And I think maybe um, it'll be fun to start doing um, some JPA. So uh, JPA is the Java Persistence Architecture. And a question that we get asked a lot is, in Java, how do we test with data? How do we interact with data? Um, it's really a very simple type of a thing. Um, and its premise. When you're dealing with testing data, you basically want to have your preconditions be met in that the database is in some known state. Then you want to perform your actions. And then you want to assert your post conditions. You know, make sure that the actions resulted in a state change as you expect. The reason this gets to be a little bit more complex and involved is because um, you need to actually go and issue the commands to put the database in a known state at the beginning and then do all the checking at the end. And that can be kind of laborious and you know, obviously labor intensive and not all that fun. So um, we've got some ways to help out with that. Um, for those of us who haven't yet seen an Archelian test, um, this is kind of the makeup of it. We have a simple Pojo class. This one we've called conference test case. Uh, and we have this run with annotation which, uh, as you can see, is a JUnit standard annotation where you can swap in a new test runner, and we give it uh, the Archelian test runner. And what this does is this gives Archelian control over the entire test uh, rather than, you know, when you leave this out, you get, like, the standard JUnit block for test runner. It's called something similar to this. Um, and now that Archelian's got control, we can do all sorts of neat stuff. Um, like, we can interact with a backend container. In this case, it'll be JBoss EAP. We can um, inject uh, things directly into the test. So for instance, if we're going to be interacting with a data store, probably we should have our own view of this. This is what we call a repository. And a repository is basically our wrapper around the entity manager where we can do things like store and get and remove. Uh, and we have a repository type for every type of, you know, Thing that we want to store in. Um, and we can actually inject that as a CDI being directly into our test because Archelian knows how to handle that. Um, 
something we'll do is we'll like define our deployment shrink wrap uh, right here ends up being uh, a library that allows us to represent in a, a like a war or a jar or an ear but as an object and this saves us from having to do uh, a full build so we can actually run this test make a change hit save in our IDE let our IDE do the incremental compilation and then rerun the test again uh, and we don't have to like do a full build, build step and, and wait for that whole process. Um, again, this is all kind of like very basic Archelian stuff, which is um, if you're if you're really interested and and you're feeling like you're falling a bit behind, Archelian.org here has a series of guides, uh, and the Getting Started guide and the Creating Deployable Archives with Shrink Wrap guide have both been translated into any number of languages, and they do a pretty great job. Um, of detailing why shrink wrap, how to make deployments, uh, what what's in the various API, getting your first Archelian test up and running. Uh, these are really great resources. Um, and I say that not just because I wrote one of them. Um, so let's get back to this, you know, JPA testing. So now we've got like the infrastructure in place to do to do a JPA test. You know that Archelian is going to be interacting with the container and deploying things into it for us. It's going to it's going to send it our deployment. It's going to give us our injection. Uh, and now we can actually like write test code exactly like we'd want to, right? And like this test class is should be able to create a conference. So basically we're going to go we're going to create a conference object. We're going to use the repository to store it. We're going to assert that the, you know, uh, the created event was fired. Um, and we can also do things like, you know, associate with sessions and whatever. What we're missing in here um, is obviously an assertion to show that the conference, uh, not only that the event was fired, but the conference was actually stored in the repository and exists in the database. Uh, this test annotation right here is a standard JUnit one. This one we've added. We have a community contributor by the name of uh, Fartosh, uh, and he... Uh, has made the JPA extension for us. Archelian is a pretty extensible framework. The core doesn't do too much on its own. We give it personalities through our extensions and container adapters. So this JPA extension will actually allow us to um, externalize our data sets that we want to validate against at the end. So what we do is we create our conference, we store it, we perform the one assertion we want manually on our own, but the rest of the assertions are all done by taking a look at the data set that's described here in this YAML file and making sure that it's all in place. So I'll even go and, and show us, um, I think this button right here. These are the data sets, you know, conference YAML, so I'll find this and pop it open. Um, let's just open it up right here, actually. And we see that, like, we've externalized our data definition here. Um, in this YAML file. That's all well and good for like when there's one, maybe you'd maybe want to write your own assertions in code if it's just one entry, but you can imagine what this would look like if we started to actually like have maybe a million records or, you know, that kind of a thing. So, um, you know, that actually ends up being pretty useful to make sure that we don't have to write our own assertions. We can just uh, assert based on the YAML file. We can match on two data sets too. Uh, here we should be able to match, create conference with a session. We have a conference YAML file and a session YAML file. Um, let's actually go through through running this because maybe you haven't seen uh, Archelian tests um, because they have this Archelian runner are really just standard JUnit tests at their core. Um, I have EAP running right here in this window, um, and um, if I were to just say run as JUnit test. We're going to launch this thing right in the IDE. You'll see that we deploy and we do everything uh, here in this window. Um, and uh, our JUnit runner shows that we've completed and we get our results just as, as we would any other JUnit test. The difference is, uh, let's see if I can do that again and, and show you what's going on in the console. Um, the difference is this is actually doing a real deployment. This is interacting with a real EAP instance. Um, you can see that we're actually executing right here uh, some SQL through Hibernate. So this is a, a full-on integration test, but um, the test 
code that we write is really small. It's just exactly what we want to do and really not all that much more. And then, you know, the JPA extension allows us to do our assertions on the data sets to make sure that everything matches correctly. Um, and we get our results right here. So it's, it's a pretty powerful tool um, um, with dealing with data and, and JPA. Um, we also have here this using data set. Uh, this is, we talked a little bit earlier about both the pre and post conditions. Using data set is for the pre conditions. Uh, and should match data sets for the post. So if we want to put our database in a known state first, this is what will allow us to apply an externalized model and put it into our data set. And then we'll execute this code here, and then our Killian will then match the data set as described here. Uh, so we can actually, with very little code, write some very powerful stuff to make sure that um, you know, that our conference repository is working correctly, or if you had made some business logic layer and you were going to call upon that. Um, we've got some very powerful, slim mechanisms for dealing with data and taking away a lot of the boilerplate that you might otherwise assume is associated with doing work with data. Um, another thing that we should really keep in mind when you're dealing with data is um, that, you know, J JPA always kind of works in tandem, uh, or traditionally works in tandem with, with transactions. So we want to be able to give you uh, some very fine-grained transaction control, and, and we do. Again, uh, this is another test case um, where we're dealing with conference objects, um, and it extends from this base transactional specification class. Um, again, Archelian, very powerful. Because when we're doing an Archelian test with EAP, we're actually taking the test case, uh, we're taking an instance of it, and we're, we're injecting the test class into the deployment. So when we execute these tests, we're executing them within the context of a deployment inside the server, not actually on the client machine. So we can do things like inject user transactions, or you could inject an entity manager directly uh, into your test, and that gives you some very fine-grained control over doing things like determining when you want the transaction to begin and then calling your calling the code you'd like and then committing it on your own or defining your own rollbacks and and explicitly you know saying you want to set this transaction to roll back to, to do that um, you get some very uh, you get some very powerful ways of testing like to make sure for instance that we can make a new do that we can make a new domain object we can go to commit it. We can mark it for rollback, and then uh, when we go to when we go to commit again here, um, we can make sure that the object uh, shouldn't be removed when we roll back the transaction because you know we rolled it back. So it's like very powerful stuff that we can do here to make sure that our transactional boundaries uh, are are kept proper, um, that we're respecting our transactional boundaries, that um, we've given you hooks in to do stuff uh, at a very, very detailed level, um, at a very fine-grained level in the code, hopefully without having to write too much boilerplate on your own. So, you know, and then we end up with test cases that look like this, that have like very little code in them, uh, or the base class, which has, you know, still, this is all test code. We're not writing boilerplate stuff to set up databases or get uh, at transaction managers. Um, it's been very powerful for us. So, uh, to give myself a little bit of a, a break from just straight talking, maybe perhaps um, we'll go, Paul, do we have, like, at this point, any questions? Is anything flooded in? Do we have any questions on the JPA stuff that I can clear up before we go on to some of our other examples? So, no, we don't have any questions at the moment, but okay. um, so Joshua was pointing out that we should probably let people know where the chat room is. So those coming through the meetup link, well, may have noticed the chat link, but um, others coming from, say, a YouTube event, for example, may not have noticed that. So I'm just going to share my screen and show you what you need to do to join the chat. Um, okay. Okay. So um, on the meetup page, there's a link to the web chat. So this is the same link that we use every time we have a virtual JBook session, uh, and I'll show you where that link goes. So it goes, essentially it's an IRC, it's a web IRC chat client, um, and the channel is VJBug. 
So you can basically just type in your nickname, type in whatever you want. So Pauline, um, and then I need to type in the capture. Can read it. Is it? Okay, five five eight. And then you're in the chat room, and then you can just ask questions away. Okay, and we've got a real question as well. Great. Okay, so um, in the future we'll we'll hopefully make this a bit clearer. So the plan in the future is to create a virtual JBug um, homepage on JBus Developer, where we'll pull everything together. Hopefully, then it'll be a lot easier to you know watch the session live and join the chat and things. Okay, so I'm just going to check the question. Okay. Okay, so here's a question from La Sombra. Um, using a remote container, can a development team with, say, 10 developers use remotely one single JBoss or Wildfly instance if that instance is properly configured memory wise, of course? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, However, um, you'll want to make sure that you have enough isolation <laughs> that you're not um, you're running into each other. But yeah, you could put up uh, you could put up one one kind of shared server just to get up and running, and and execute remotely against that. Um, typically, what I do, you know, if I'm if I'm going to be running a lot of tests, well, let me back up a little bit for everybody. Um, with, with the EE servers, we've separated out the notion of what we call um, a remote container, which just means it's a, a remote VM, right? So you have the client VM for your test, and then there's the remote VM, just a separate process for, for your application server. We have what we call a managed container, um, which is the same thing really as a remote, except we also manage the life cycle of start and stop. So you can actually not have a, a server running at all, and when you launch the, the Archelian test, it will start up EAP or Wildfly or any of these for you, do the deployment, execute the test, undeploy, and then shut down uh, the remote process for you. And then also some of the containers have embedded, meaning that like we'll bring up the container in the same VM that, that your client uh, executed to start to launch the JUnit test. Um, And you can absolutely share a remote one. It's just a process that's out there running, and, and you send a protocol over to it to, to do the deployment. Um, it's not the issue, but you know, I would I would worry a little bit about isolation sometimes. Um, if you know, just making sure that like if you're deploying an application, it's got a separate space from some other developer who's doing something, uh, and 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 dealing with it that way. I, I tend to think it's intelligent to write your tests in a way that you can uh, run everything on your machine uh, as it would in a stage or shared environment or like a CI environment and that, that ends up being enough for me. So my typical workflow is have all the engineers um, executing locally the tests, running the test suite before they commit and then when they do it should kick off a CI job and, and do it on maybe a staging server that, um, that very closely resembles your production environment. That, that would be my advice. So I'm not sure if this is where the requirement's coming from, but I imagine some other vendors, app servers, come with license fees that prohibit developers from having their own instances on their own developer machines. Yeah, oh, that could that could very well be, yeah, sure. Yeah, so I guess that's something we're not really used to. Um, um, yeah. Okay, so I think that answers the question. Um, so unfortunately, I forgot to um, switch the video stream to myself when I was explaining where the web chat was. So I'll just try that again. Okay, let's. Uh, okay, so so from the meetup page, we've got a web chat link here, and that just opens up um, to a free node web chat. So just type your name in to there. The channel is VJBook. So if you have your own IRC channel, you can um, you can just. You, Join VJ Bug on, on Freenode, then type in the capture, and then you're in the room so you can join the discussion. I'll type something hello. Oops, here we go. I'm, actually, I'm in the room now. I'll type hello. Okay. Um, so as I've said before, in future we'll have a we're working on a better way of doing this, but at the moment this is what we've got.
So how about time do? So uh, just let me check if there's some more discussion. Cool. Yeah. No, we've got yeah we've got plenty more. Um, so okay. that last example there um, was was just for anyone paying attention. That was from chapter five. So we were dealing with Java persistence and relational data. Um, it's my intent always when when I do these types of things to just show you what's possible and not have you really necessarily. Uh, you don't have to really concern yourself with understanding exactly how to hook it together. That's why we link back to this stuff. That's why all the docs are open source. Um, this should probably explain it a, a bit better for everybody. So uh, that's chapter five of the book, and again, everything's um, online. Uh, the next chapter I'd probably like to go into, um, chapter seven deals with business logic and the services layer. Um, I realized uh, as I was doing all that, I was clicking around and not sharing my screen. I'm sorry. One more time. Okay. Uh, business logic and the services layer. That's chapter seven here. Um, for this chapter, we took the use case of uh, like a user sign up triggering uh, sending of an, an email. Like this is a really type of a common use case for, for doing application development. A user signs up, they put in their information, they give you the email, and then you've got to send some sort of a confirmation email to them. Uh, this ends up being actually quite difficult to test for several reasons. Um, you're usually dealing with some sort of an external, um, an external service, like an SMTP server. It's inherently asynchronous. And testing asynchronous stuff is, is difficult. Um, so we thought maybe we'd, we'd build up an example for this, for this case here and see what we can do to address it. So uh, I've made this SMTP mail service test case. And again, this whole thing, if you get lost, is going to be documented in chapter 7 of the book right here called Business Logic and the Services Layer. Um, this test here deals with um, I've built I've built out a couple components here. Um, I've made this thing called the SMTP mail service, which I've implemented as a singleton EJB, meaning that it's uh, an EJB that where only one instance will be made, and uh, I've injected a bunch of um, like Java mail type stuff uh, and uh, and a JMS queue. Um, there's two methods here. One is called send mail to send mail immediately, and it's blocking, and the other one is called queue mail for delivery. The reason I think we should queue mail for delivery and, and make this um, asynchronous as soon as possible is because when the user hits the register, the register button, they shouldn't necessarily have to wait for the server to go connect to an external resource like an SMTP server to send a message. Um, it should probably get the, the return right away anyway because they're not going to SMTP is inherently asynchronous. Why wait to connect to the server? So what I like to do is I like to take the mail messages and I like to put them on a JMS queue uh, and then have a, a consumer come along, which is this guy here, to pull them off the queue and then send them uh, to the EJB, which where they can be sent like via this method right here called send mail. Um, we get some nice abstraction through um, through using uh, a mail session right here, a Java X mail session, which we're going to pull out of uh, JNDI. Um, because we do that, we can, while we're testing, swap in our own implementation. Um, and we can swap in our own implementation of uh, a server. So what I do here uh, is I've made this SMTP server service. This is um, also implemented as a singleton EJB. Uh, it's going to start up when it's deployed. But as you'll notice, it's under the test uh, folder here. So it's not actually ever going to be used in production. This is something I built out um, for testing only. And what we'll do is I'll make this like what I call it, you know, a, a pluggable receive handler. And we'll say um, when, we, when we deliver mail, we're going to allow uh, the test to define what we do in the middle. So back to our test case. Um, what we're going to do, I have a method called test SMTP async. I am going to define the body of an email. 
Then I'll create this thing called a cyclic barrier. Um, I find that most people don't actually know what this is or use it too often. Um, it's part of the, the standard JDK and been there since JDK 5. Um, it's part of the Java Util concurrent package. It's a cyclic barrier. And what it is is it, it, it puts up kind of a blocking point where the thread will block until the number of entrants has been met. So uh, until two people are blocking on it, this thing will block any anyone who's here. If I put a three there, it would block three people until you know until three people came. Uh, then I will go and I will set a handler here in, in the SMTP server service, and I'll say, all right, when we when the SMTP server gets this, first of all, we're going to assert that it's received the body of the email contents through the service the way that they've been intended. Uh, and the, the SMTP server itself is going to wait on a barrier um, and, and not just pass through. This is just a handler that we're set, right? So we're not actually running this code right now. We're setting a handler. And the rest of the test case will continue. And we'll say, hey, let's make a message. And uh, you know, I'll put my email address and the subject and the body right here. And then I'm going to queue it up for delivery. And now I'm going to have the test case wait on this barrier. So the test case has created a mail message. They've set a handler to wait on a barrier. They've sent the mail message. And now the test case itself is waiting on the barrier. So we queue this for delivery. The test case starts to wait. Presumably, we've now sent off uh, another thread. Uh, as this goes into the JMS queue, is pulled off the JMS queue, is sent over to the SMTP server, where it's now going to like enter this because we're entering the handler. We're going to reach this barrier await call, which will be the second one. This is one. This is two. And remember from the beginning, we set cyclic barrier count to two. So now they're both there, and the test can proceed and succeed. This is a multi-threaded, um, full-on integration test that tests asynchronous components reliably. That's kind of the beauty of using Archelion here. Uh, is because um, asynchronous components are in, like they're historically very difficult to test. Uh, in the application server team years back, we actually you know we wrote a JMS subsystem and we had to write tests for it. And what we would do is we would create a JMS message, we'd put it onto a queue, and then we'd have the test wait 10 seconds, and then we would send another message behind it to see if the first message had succeeded. And this was problematic for two reasons. One is because we had all these thread dot sleeps for 10 seconds in there, and when you have several hundred tests, that several hundred times 10 seconds really adds to your build time. And the other problem is that the 10 seconds wasn't really a reliable wait time. Maybe there was a lot going on with the other servers. Maybe they were uh, on kind of like slow CI environments, and we would get these transient errors. So uh, we never really had clean builds, and they would take forever. This is a, a much more reliable way of doing this by using the concurrent util package and, uh, and a cyclic barrier to reliably test um, uh, an asynchronous component. And I think I'd like to open this one up for some questions as well, because I think uh, this is a pretty complex topic, and I want to make sure we didn't kind of lose anybody there. OK, so there's, we don't have any questions at the moment, but there is a. The problem is there's a minute lag so on on YouTube. So by stopping to oh sure I see so by stopping to ask for questions, you might have to wait a minute before you actually. That's fine. Uh, we'll we'll go forward and um, we'll just make a note that if anyone has questions, to like enter them as they come up, um, so we don't you know wait for them. Yeah. Absolutely. I also like to call out this like nuclear yellow drink I've been drinking like vitamin C water for like a week now since I've been sick. I don't know if it does anything, but it makes me at least feel better about myself. So that's, I guess that, that has some placebo effect, right? Um, yeah, if nothing else has come in, I think I will continue along. We'll, we'll yeah, just go ahead. I'm sorry? Um, just, just go ahead. There's, yeah. uh, there's no questions at the moment, but I'll interrupt you if there is. Oh, great. Um, We'll do we'll do one more. Uh, let's do let's do just one more of these, I think, um, because I think it's a lot to really kind of wrap your head around. Uh, this next one will be uh, from. Um, oh, I do want to call this out. Um, where am I? 
Uh, chapter 8 uh, deals with REST and addressable services. So, I mean, after we've exposed our service layer, um, after, after we've written our service layer, presumably in either CDI or EJB, um, it, it's nice to make, make those services addressable. And we have a, a chapter on, on uh, like RESTful service architecture and, and how we do uh, RESTful architecture in Java EE. Um, and also, as you may expect to boot, we have, um, we have some examples to go alongside that as well. So I'll pull that up. Um, which one was I doing before? I think it was this guy. Great. Um, so a major design goal, again, of Archelion is, is to be interoperable and, and play nicely with all sorts of other techs. Again, like the Archelion core uh, is, is really kind of a, a plug-in-based architecture, and it's extensible. And um, there are a lot of great tools, for instance, like there's this Hamcrest, and, and we use Rest Assured pretty often uh, in, testing, in testing our RESTful services, as you can see, like... Right here, plenty of plenty of stuff from the Rest Assured library, and we'll show that in a minute. Uh, this test is going to do; uh, it's going to run as client, as we say. So this is more of a traditional black box test, which is appropriate for a RESTful test because instead of putting a deployment into the server and then executing things from inside the deployment on the server side, this one should really be from the client, right? We're testing RESTful services. Um, so we should really be executing a request and receiving the response and seeing if the response is as we expect. Uh, so we have this run as client annotation, which enables us to do that. Um, and we're also going to use uh, Archelion Warp, which is a, a series of um, classes and annotations which will allow us to, to better bridge the gap in, in client and server-side testing. Um, this right here is the conference resource uh, specification test case which, uh, you know, is um, going to extend from this base repository one. And what we do here is we have, um, we've, we've, just, we've defined a bunch of media types and type media types and URI segments. We can inject uh, the base URI or the base URL for, um, for our, our, RESTful, um, our RESTful interface. And we'll perform tests that are like, you know, we, we should return a, a not found on a get request when there's a missing resource. And we should return a not found on a delete request uh, where the, when there's a missing resource. And we piece these together using, um, using the rest assured library because it's very expressive. You know, we can say, all right, given a content type of our base media type, then we should get um, a status code of not found um, which is you know an HTTP status of not found when we request something and, and it's it's the ID is and it's missing, um, and um, we can very like powerfully create these these types of with a, a natural language syntax from REST assured and using warp to like couple all these together to to execute real requests uh, and and get back. The responses. So we're going to make HTTP requests. We're going to get the responses back, and um, in this test, I think we actually even uh, printed off the. Uh, you can actually see the requests coming in, and and what we received back. Um, so again, like you know, if you'll notice a theme with the restful stuff that we're doing, or, or in anything that we're doing with Archelion, is to try and integrate. With as many third-party like systems as there are, and uh, kind of bridge between uh, third-party frameworks for testing and for the our, our various uh, application servers, uh, and and bring them all together with with a a little bit of syntactic sugar and some gel with Archelion to to make it easy to write the tests and make it enjoyable. Because like let's be honest, it's really uh, for me. 
testing is about is testing is when I get my enjoyment out of coding. It's when I get to see that the APIs that I've written are, are very clear on the screen. It's when I get to see that I've made something and it starts to work. It assures that it's going to work in the future. Um, if someone goes to make a change, then I've got my tests and they're all runnable and they don't break. And also, you know, I've very, I've very recently realized too that um, without testing, continuous integration is just a really powerful, quick way to push errors to production. Testing is the thing that enables continuing continuous integration to take place because you can have uh, a Git push power of deployment all day long, but if you're not testing and making sure that you've got some confidence in the code that you're deploying up there, that whole thing falls apart really quickly. So, um, you know, in, in the DevOps story that's developed over recent years, uh, to me, testing is at the very, very center of it, and it makes all the sense in the world for us to, to put some real thought into not just the, the business logic that we're writing, but the tests that we're writing, and making sure that we're, we're writing them efficiently and we're testing the, the difficult to test stuff because that stuff is going to be the one that's first to break anyway, and that we're running it uh, as quickly and easily as you are a unit test, right? I mean, that's the goal of Archelion is to give you the unit test experience with the integration test payload, right? And, and we, we feel that we really do that here. Again, um, some resources that end up being very, very helpful, I think, uh, are the Archelion website itself, and then also the, the book repo, which has, um, in addition to, to all of the code examples that are runnable and importable into your own stuff, the, the entire book, the contents of the book uh, from start to scratch, uh, from start to finish. Um, and it, it, was, it was like a lot of fun to write. It, it was a lot of fun to really see in, in like a tangible form um, a representation of the lessons that we had learned in building Archelian it informed our decisions in, in, how to, in how to make applications as well. So this was like actually a, a lot of fun for us to do. And um, yeah, I, you know, I think maybe some more questions at this point. And I honestly think, I know we, we normally go an hour, but I think, Paul, any more, any more material is, is probably just going to over, overload and overwhelm, I think. So yeah, so I've, possibly. Um, I've, we've got some questions, so let's see oh, how the questions go and then Maybe if we run out of questions, maybe you've got something interesting to talk about briefly. So we've got a, a contentious question from the um, audience. So Joshua would like to know, does Andrew practice test-driven development or behavior-driven driven development, or does he just write tests after the code like the rest of us? Cool, yeah. I mean, I get this question a lot, and it's one that I like. Um, I'm actually not not a hardliner for this. I, I know it, it seems like I come across sometimes as very opinionated in, in how I go and address testing because I believe it's it's like fundamentally important to programming. Um, but uh, no, I, I don't I don't take any stance regarding which should be done first so long as everything is committed together. So for instance, if I'm writing a new feature or I'm doing a bug fix, um, the test that tests that feature goes in alongside in the same commit as um, as the code that, that made it. And the reason for that is uh, I like a really clean uh, audit trail um, when I'm doing Git. So if I want to roll back a commit, I'm rolling back uh, something that's like an atomic unit and it's not going to break the state of the repo um, because I needed to also roll back other commits. Um, I do kind of an, an iterative testing type of a thing. A lot of times what I will do is flesh out my API, and then I'll start to write some tests um, because it'll show me what my API looks like. You know, when I, when I start to, when I write the test, it's the first time I've used the API. Um, and then I'll probably go and flesh out some of the implementation stuff. Sometimes if I'm in the mood, I'll like write all the implementation stuff too. It's like a fun little game for me. Like, hey, can I like do this API and implementation stuff um, all at once and then like write the tests and have everything like work you know if it's if it's small enough um, but yeah I don't I don't think you should have to do anything first or anything last I think you should do whatever is the most enjoyable the most productive the most efficient uh, and the most correct and um, and then just make sure it's tested a lot of times 
I end up like writing really boring tests for things like um, hash code and equals methods. Like that ends up like being really important sometimes. Um, and I'll write those like just when I'm making my value objects. So, so I guess the point is that you know you do what works best for you whilst you're doing your own personal development because you know everybody's everybody works differently. But at the point when you're going to commit it to the central repository that other people are using, at that point, that's where the rigor comes in. At that point, you need to provide the tests. Right. And how you came up with those tests, which order, doesn't, is kind of irrelevant at that point. Sure. And when I say, you know, the commits are atomic, um, no, that's, like, not true. As I'm working, I'll actually commit, like, several times an hour and then push, you know, as often as I want to my own origin. Uh, and but like when when the thing is done, when my topic branch is done, I'm squashing that all into one commit, and that's what everyone is going to go see. Um, but yeah, you know, that, I think that's kind of a long-winded way of of explaining it. But um, bottom line, I think I think as long as the code that you're writing is tested at the time it's being written, I don't think you have to be so so hard as to say make your API, make your test, and then only then do your implementation code. You know, I think that makes sense. I think the, the other good thing, the other thing to point out is that by committing them in tandem, it means that you get a um, a testable commit history. So if if something, if you detect something's broken, you can go and do a git bisect, yeah, to find out when that thing went wrong. Yeah. Whereas if you've got a mess of, you know, feature changes and tests, you know, if you're adding a feature and then later on you add a test for that feature, it makes it quite difficult to figure out. You know when when things happened. You know, yeah, and this is a little bit of a tangential topic, but I get I, I get into this sometimes with folks um, that maybe I haven't worked with as much. You know, and I'm 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 very rigorous about the maintenance of of like the commit history in a Git repo, and um, not everyone is that way. And in fact, there's a lot of like really successful projects at JBoss that are not run that way. I find that yeah yeah every every commit should be like an atomic thing that can be rolled rolled back or removed entirely independently of everything else if there's an issue, um, and I find it it's like really really helpful for tracking the state of a project over time and, and if you ever have to do any maintenance on anything that's not not trivial, um, and yeah it's. No, I, I do. I do think that's a, that's a worthwhile just like development topic to think about your Git history, and um, when you get pull requests, you know maybe you know squash them together or squash together your own stuff. I'm I'm typically massaging the commits of like just about every pull request uh, I review in some way. Okay, that's a good answer. Um, so the other the other kind of follow up question was. Um, so if test-driven development or behavior-driven development, what has he found Achillean has helped the most with? So, um, so Achillean's not going to impose any type of, of testing on you, really. I mean, we, we, um, we integrate in with behavior-driven development frameworks. Um, uh, I know that, that Bartosz and John Ferguson Smart, uh, and these guys are like, they're very like um, BDD like centric guys. Archillion is mostly to me about being the glue that like brings everything together so I don't have to write a lot of boilerplate. Um, Archillion ends up being the enabling technology that lets me test the difficult parts, that lets me do the injections and not have to worry about uh, like the container lifecycle or all the boilerplate stuff that I used to write. Um, or or all the boilerplate stuff that I didn't write because I felt like it wasn't worth it to do a tremendous setup for for a test. So Archillion ends up being the piece that that if I'm doing a cost benefit analysis of do I spend a bunch of time writing this test just to have the test um, because Archillion's made it so much easier. Um, that that answer is usually like yeah, write the test. Yeah. Makes sense. So I think the the point is that it's it's not what does Achillean what is Achillean better at doing? It's um, which style of testing um, has the better plugins, which yeah. is just dependent on the maturity of the 
plug-in um, community, really, development. Right. You know, we, we had the Hamcrest stuff and the Rest Assured, and we've used, you know, Cucumber. And there's, I mean, there's like a, the, the number of extensions for Arcillion out there, are, they're staggering, and they're they're growing every day. I see Ashlock and, and the team and the people from the community are constantly putting new ideas in because, you know, development, um, development goes on long after, like, uh, Arcillion was conceived, and because we had the extension API, it continues. The community continues to grow in directions we never envisioned. It's a sign of a good community, I guess, isn't it? So. It's, uh, you know, I, I attribute a lot of that to to Oshlock's foresight mm -hmm. into making. You know, I think I had wanted to do a container API, and I think he he built out this extension API as well. So not only can we interact with a variety of backing backend containers, it was what else can we do to hook into our Killian core to give it new personalities? So you know, I attribute that to his foresight. Another question? Yeah. So the question is, what percentage of test coverage do you think is possible with all the plugins that are available in yeah. light of 100% being very hard, if not impossible, without our Killian? Yeah. Um, I don't want to I don't want to come across as sounding like cheeky or dismissive of the question. Um, I actually really don't like uh, code coverage percentage points as an absolute metric. Um, it's the type of thing that, like, I mean, clearly you want to strive for, like, 100% or as close to as you can. Um, what I end up doing instead is um, I have the uh, the uh, ECL Emma plugin, ECL Emma, which is, like, um, integrating Emma's code coverage tool with Eclipse. And what you can do then is uh, when you're executing your tests in the IDE, um, it'll actually paint your test classes like red if not covered and green if, if it is covered. And it'll show you the percentage points and stuff as well. But I find um, that code coverage, rather than a tool that I use in CI, is something that I use like while I'm building and while I'm writing. Because as, as I make the API, as I write the tests, as I'm fleshing out the implementation, it's then that I'm like continually running the tests over and over. And if I see my code painted in front of me, like, oh, look, there's a whole code path here in an if statement you need to cover. Or like this whole method you didn't go through yet, so you should write a test for it. That's when I find the most benefit to using the code coverage tools um, to kind of poke holes and stuff. But then there's sometimes that, like, you know, I'll get a bunch of paths that just, like, due to the nature of the way the code is written, I, you know, it, the, the, the percentage point goes down. So, again, I don't use it as an absolute metric. I use it... Uh, as a tool to show me where I need to write more tests, and and uh, I'll make a judgment call over like what is sufficient enough. Yeah, cool. So I think um, I guess the other thing is it depends on your application. So for example, if it's a Java E application, then maybe it's possible to get quite high code coverage due to the amount of Java E plugins. Whereas if you're writing I know, some other type of application. Where you don't have as much support, but with, with other types of frameworks, yeah, maybe you know you're going to end up with a lower, um, lower coverage. So I, I don't think I don't think anyone's agreeing that we should, you know, just strive for 100% just for the sake of it. But I think I think most people agree it's a it's a useful indicator, isn't it, of what's not tested, so you can at least make a decision, make a call. Yeah. So I've got another question here. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, yeah. So I think Joshua has just um, qualified his question in the same way as I did just then. So he's saying the question has less to do with a percentage and more about the ability to actually test things like REST that we can do now. So I think, again, I think it kind of just it depends on your application that you're writing, doesn't it, and whether there's a plugin framework available. But it does seem like the you know new plugins for Achillean have been announced what feels like every week. Um, maybe that's an exaggeration, but it's it, it's on Twitter. It's pretty common to see Aslak or you or Dan Allen or somebody tweeting about some new alpha one of a new new plugin support for some framework. So it, it seems to be a pretty busy community. Yeah, it's, you know, and you know they have varying levels of maturity. Um, like you know, for instance, like the JPA one that I showed today, I think it was like you know just really kind of great and mature and um, yeah, you know the code code. I'll, I'll say this: if you know, I'm I'm usually getting upwards of 80 percent code coverage, which is 
um, a lot when you consider all the stuff that like can't ever be a green line, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so that sounds pretty good. So the question I had for you was: um, so you were using you were using Dev Studio to run your Killian tests. Yeah. What did you need to do to get that running? Did you was it was, does it work out of the box, or did you have to install some plugins? No, no, no. I mean, like Archillion, Archillion is uh, implemented as a JUnit runner and also as a TestNG runner. Um, so anything that'll run JUnit or TestNG will run Archillion. Um, I use JB Dev Studio because um, uh, it, it's <laughs> quite honestly, it has this like Maven plugin in it where you can like right click on a project and select the Maven profile you want to use for that uh, for that project. And when you apply the Maven profile, it'll set the correct dependencies that are defined in that profile. And I, I find that to be like a really awesome feature. Um, and I do that mostly when I'm like doing demos and stuff. I also do a lot of coding in IntelliJ. But yeah, to answer the question, um, anything that can run a JUnit test can run an Archillion test. So it'll run straight from your Maven build with no plugins. It'll run from your CI. It'll run just as we did, you know, right click run as from the IDE. It runs from Ant. No, no other plugins. You know, that was a major design goal that we had in the very beginning, because we wanted to make it. We wanted to make it so that adoption for Archelian could be as simple as just anyone who was writing a JUnit test. Excellent. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, so we have another question. Yeah. And that's, I don't know if you know the answer to this, but how does Archelian compare to Pax Exam on OSGI platforms like JWS Fuse? Um, I actually, I'm not certain. I'm sorry. I thank you for the question. Um, and I can, if we post it or something, I can like do some research. But I'm, um, I'm, I'm not the most qualified person to to talk about the comparison with something I haven't used. I suppose. No problem. No problem. Um, okay. Let's see if there's any more questions. I'd recommend, by the way, uh, asking on the Archelian forums, though, because our community is like a, a little bit more far-reaching. My background. Um, before Archelian, prior to Archelian was in Java EE, um, you know, and, and obviously, like we've we've made OSGI wrappers around our JBoss modules, you know, system w which we build Wildfly and and, and uh, EAP off. But um, yeah, I didn't come from an OGI world, OSG OSGI world. No problem. Um, just looking to see if there's any more questions. So there's no more questions at the moment. Cool. Um, I guess there's a quick, we probably owe you a quick plug of your book. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's called Continuous Enterprise Development in Java. It's out from O'Reilly. Um, while I'm plugging, um, we are putting on uh, our second our second Dev Nation. This is, this is uh, the second conference. It's the conference for open source uh, developers and DevOps. And... Um, you know, we want to take a real community approach. We want to integrate the best of what's open in, in development. We launched uh, the CFP very recently, and that's uh, over at devnation.org, and that'll be taking place in Boston in June of 2015. So send me your ideas, send me send me your stuff, and, uh, you know, get in on the CFP, and we'll, we'll have a CFP review committee, and... Um, it's going to be it's going to be an awesome time and and it, a lot of developer focused content is what we're aiming for. Great, yeah, it was it was a very successful event last year, wasn't it? The first event. So. Oh, yeah, I thought I thought in terms of you know I thought in terms of the the content quality that the people brought and the level of discussions and the labs that we had after hours, I thought it was, I thought it was a really awesome time, um, and I, yeah, I was I was really I was really pleased. Absolutely. I think the difficult thing was just deciding which sessions to go to. There's just like too much overlap with good sessions. So I guess it's a high quality problem, really, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I, you know, those are the problems I love to have. You know? Yeah. Uh, but you know, we also we also video record. You know, a, a large majority of them, uh, and and last year's are up online too. And we're you know going to look to do the same thing again this year too. So it's for those who can't make it, uh, should should still be able to like be a part of the discussion and get the content. Excellent. Um, so there's a couple of other things. Mm -hmm. Running one, I can't remember. But anyway, one of the things was, can you? What's the URL for your the, the website? So continuousdev.org. Yeah, it's, it's you know it's continuousdev.org, and uh, for the past several weeks, I've been embroiled in a 
um, trying to reclaim the domain. I think they, uh, it's, it's been difficult to reclaim the domain. So for the time being, um, it's just the, the GitHub site, github.com slash Archelian slash continuous enterprise development. Okay, yeah, sure. Okay, so what, what does the website have on it? The, uh, the website really only had links to like the, the, the GitHub repo. I mean, we've put everything into the GitHub repo. So the book site, you know, the stuff that was in the website was like links to our Twitter feed and into the repo and, and where to buy the book. Okay, cool. Yep. Okay, so. Which can be purchased like directly through Amazon, uh, directly through O'Reilly or through Amazon. Very good. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Andrew. I think, oh, no, we've got a That's, question. Oh, Just, one more. So, um, I'm not sure if I'll repeat the question, but I'm not sure I understand what the question is. Sure. The question is, is testing a SOAP web service similar to testing REST using run as client? Using? Is testing a, a SOAP web service yeah. similar to testing REST using at run as client. Oh yeah, yes. Using at run as client, yes, it is. Um, we didn't put a SOAP-based example in the book, but if you're exposing any service via SOAP and you have the WSDL thing and you can execute a request to it and get the response back, yes, very very similar in its makeup. Uh, you know, the only difference there is, you know, the payload instead of being you know, JSON or whatever is returned by the RESTful service is going to be. Uh, a soapy thing. Excellent. And do you have do you have an example of this on your, uh, in your book or on the GitHub site? I don't, because we were you know we were building one modern application and we, we chose to solve each use case in one way and show one way of accomplishing it. Um, and uh, like RESTful based services looked to be you know the more modern trend, so we, we went with that direction instead of you know, soap way. Yeah. Uh, although I will say that we did attack data from many different from angles, you know, I showed the relational case earlier, but um, you know, I think you need to choose your data model based upon the types of data you have. And we have many different types of data uh, and different use cases for getting through them. So we actually have um, we have a we have a, a relational store for a lot of the stuff. We have a, a, a like a map database um, in InfiniSpan for some of the stuff, and uh, we also have a graph database for navigating relationships. So and we we talk about you know the, when you would use each and, and how to test with each as well. Excellent, thank you, Andrew. So um, the guys, this was a real pleasure. Thank you for having me, and um, yeah, this this is awesome. So uh, I'm at Al Rubinger on Twitter, and uh, you guys can feel free to follow up there. Excellent, thank you, Andrew. Um, Okay, so I'll say goodbye. Uh, okay, so that's the end of the session. Uh, hopefully, we'll see you next week for. Antoine's session on CDI, where we'll be talking about the uh, CDI from both the basics up to the advanced features. Um, also, check out our um, virtual JBug YouTube channel to see the past recordings and also some recordings we've done from uh, Java One and um, some other uh, JBoss conferences. So, I'll say goodbye. Thank you.